Um, so welcome to the final session. And this is Cultural Heritage in a Digital World. And first we'll hear from Alana Kanahela. Thank you. All right, let me get this up and running. Okay. Can you guys see this okay? Yes, wonderful. Great. Um, so thank you all for having me. Aloha mai kako. My name is Alana Kanahele. I'm a PhD student from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, and for the last five years or so, I've been working on this grassroots project known as Mukutu. Um, some of you might be familiar, familiar with Mukutu. Some of you may have never heard of it before, um, but Mukutu is a content management system that was designed alongside indigenous communities to really highlight some of the needs that um, a lot of these communities have that just aren't available in Western archival um, content management systems. So one of the big things that I think maybe comes to mind for people is um, access. You know, when you're working with indigenous communities, it's not usually just something is public or private. There's a lot of protocol that goes around what is being shared, what is being um, digitized and how it's being disseminated. And so Mukutu allows for um, very, very granular access of, um, uh, or just a, a very granular way to um, sort of look at how, you know, a community might want something shared. Sometimes in the Pacific, we see things that are, that generally tend to be around gender, um, around certain seasons, if you will, or after certain harvest, maybe so only certain songs can be heard um, uh, after, you know, after the first um, big rain or, or whatever the case may be. So Mukutu kind of allows for this um, shared access and the Mukutu content management system is a, it's low cost, it's free. If you'd like to host it on our server, you can create a website immediately. Um, it's open source, you can download it from GitHub. Um, and it's really meant for, um, for in either indigenous communities or for institutions housing indigenous work. Um, Mukutu is being used throughout the world. There's hubs in Australia, there's hubs across the US. There's about 3,500 communities that are using it right now. Um, I'm the hub manager for the Hawaii and Pacific communities. So most of my work has been um, primarily in, in recent years, kind of in the areas of Federated States of Micronesia, Marshall Islands, Guam, American Samoa, um, recently in the Solomon Islands and various parts of uh, Australia. And so what uh, our project essentially does is we provide digital preservation training. Um, we kind of teach people how to use MUKU2. Um, and this is also all, uh, all free. Um, we assist with sort of the development of sites. If your communities um, need help, um, you know, creating an, a digital archive, we do that as well. Um, but I, I think for this presentation, I really kind of wanted to sort of not talk too much about Mukutu and show you kind of how it's being used in, in various communities um, throughout the Pacific. So the first one is um, Kaipule Ohone. So this is the University of Hawaii's um, digital ethnographic archive. So they have um, 59 languages from across the Pacific that are being, um, uh, that have audio recordings that there's been research done um, for these, uh, alongside these communities. And so they've now migrated their system over to Mukutu and have been using that as a digital repository. Um, this is kind of what, what the site would look like. I just took some screenshots so I wasn't having to click through and, and showing you all the different sites. Um, but you can see as we kind of go through that the, the sites are listed on here if, if you're interested. Um, another, this is kind of a larger institution that, that's using Mukutu is the BYU, Brigham uh, Young University in uh, Hawaii. And they have a very extensive um, Hawaiian and Pacific cultural collection. Um, BYU is, is uh, aside from the UH, has a huge, huge Pacific collection in, in Hawaii. Um, and they have a very incredible scrimshaw collection. Um, if you ever get the chance to visit, I, I know it's 
become much more difficult, but um, I would highly recommend uh, visiting this, this university. Um, so they've also been using MUCA2 as, um, as a way to kind of showcase some of their digital archives. Um, one of the interesting things about MUCA2, which I'll kind of talk about later, is it allows you to have two or three or as many records as you like for an item. In this case, they've chosen to have um, the BYU record and then have the record in, in Hawaiian in our local language. And so um, that's kind of one way that Mukutu can also be used is having multiple records if you have multiple community members who are interested in, in providing um, a cultural narrative on, on your item. Um, another community we work with is Filetti Barstow Public Library. They have a pretty incredible collection over um, 750,000 images were bequeathed to them in 2012. All of these photos were taken on film by one person, one guy who has spent the last 40 years kind of looking at um, and or taking pictures of everyday life in American Samoa. And they're using it as an identification project. So they already have a thousand registered users. Their site just started um, in October. And so they've been um, slowly starting to upload each of these. About 70,000 images have been uploaded so far. We've been working with them from the beginning. It took about two years to digitize all of these images. They could digitize 24 at a time. And I think we sort of calculated that as um, around 30,000 scans that they had to do. Um, and so they're creating a very, very extensive um, identity project for um, a lot of the folks in American Samoa from 1979 to 2011 is the kind of general timeline. Um, and you can see some of these images here from, they, they've divided it into 10 separate collections. So Flag Day, which is an important holiday for them, Veterans Day, White Sunday, another holiday, high school footballs, as I'm sure a lot of you know, rugby and football are, are very huge in the Pacific. So they have a um, a pretty extensive collection of each of those as well. Um, and then we also work with the Pacific Island Ethnic Art Museum. So this isn't quite in the Pacific, it's in Long Beach, California, but it's the only museum that's um, devoted solely to Pacific Island arts. And it's the private collection of Dr. Rumbert Gumbiner, who, is, uh, who was a doctor in um, Guam initially, but set up many clinics sort of throughout CNMI, Saipan, FSM, Marshall Islands, Palau. Um, and a very well-respected figure in, in kind of that uh, Micronesia region. Um, another community that we work with are the State Library of New South Wales. So they have sort of a joint ventureship with the University of Technology at Sydney, the State Library of New South Wales, um, and, and Institute of Indigenous Education and Research. And so um, they've created a pretty extensive archive. You can see the, the links are up at the top. So if you're interested in kind of looking at um, their site more ex, ex, um, kind of more in detail, you can find it there. Um, and they work in partnership with um, Aboriginal communities. So most of their work is, is, is focused with, um, with these communities. Um, and then, so this is a, uh, finally, I just wanted to kind of close with this so you can get an idea of sort of what Mukutu would look like if you were wanting to download it, if you can think of a community that might be interested in using it or an institution that might be interested in using it. Um, this is part of the Pacific Northwest tribes. Um, so this is, I, we generally don't work too much with mainland communities with exception to um, um, First Nations people in Canada and Native Alaskan tribes. However, this one is, is with the Pacific Northwest, so kind of the area of Washington, Oregon. Um, and they created, they kind of teamed together with eight other um, Pacific tribes to look at, um, or to, to kind of showcase all of their information together. This is a, a school that unfortunately a lot of the Native American students were sent to. Um, and you can see here that they have multiple records for each of these, um, or just for this one slide. So you have the Umatilla, which is a, a Native American tribe, and the Yakimas. And they kind of add more information to the, to the archive. So the only thing that comes from the Washington State University is a description that shows the interior of the bakery. 
And if you go to the next slide, you can see, um, oops, sorry. Um, there's a little bit more of a cultural narrative here. And um, um, so there's someone talking about their time at the school. Um, they, you know, kind of showcase some of their, um, uh, them with their knowledge and their, um, their own input into the, into the archive. So this is kind of just a, just an overview of some of what's been going on. A lot of the, because we are the newest hub, the Hawaii and Pacific hub, a lot of these are not quite, um, a lot of their sites aren't up yet, so I can't show them. Um, but if you're interested in, in sort of looking at who is, um, you know, who is doing what and which communities in the Pacific are involved with, with Mukatu, um, please feel free to reach out. So just wanted to end there. Thank you guys so much. I know, I think my 10 minutes are up. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me and um, I look forward to hearing any of your questions and, and so thank you. I think it's the wrong person who was muted, but that's okay. <laughs> I can, I can, um, um, well, thank you very much, uh, Alana. That was really, really interesting. Um, I'm, um, I would like to int introduce our last speaker, um, who is uh, Gretchen Bureau. I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing your, your name correctly, um, and who is going to give a, a report on digital hum humanities at the American Museum of Asmat Art, documenting visual culture and building relationships through ARC GIS mapping. <laughs> to the Pacific Arts Association for inviting me to present and for the introduction, Wunu. I'm Gretchen Burrell coming to you from Waconia, Minnesota in the United States. I've been working with the American Museum of Osmot Art or AMAA at the University of St. Thomas for the past 10 years, first as a graduate student and now as director. Today, I would like to share some digital humanities projects I have recently created for our museum. My presentation is chronological. I will cover the basic framework of these projects as I explain how they were initiated and have progressed as a result of student involvement, traveling to Osmot and the events of 2020. I will then consider the potential for using these digital tools and other platforms as the AMAA looks to strengthen relations with the Osmot Museum of Culture and Progress in Agats and provide additional resources for Osmot people to tell their own stories in 2021. I would like to begin with some basic information about Osmot in our museum. The term Osmot refers to a people, a language, and a geographic area. Osmot homelands lie within the province of Papua, Indonesia, on the southwest coast of the island of New Guinea. Osmot are among the most prolific wood carvers and weavers in the Pacific Islands. The AMAA has one of the largest collections of Osmot art in North America, with nearly 3,000 objects dating from the mid-20th century to the present. The collection was originally formed by missionaries from the American Crozier Fathers and Brothers under the leadership of Bishop Alphonse Sawada, who used anthropological approaches to renew cultural traditions and encourage artistic production within Osmot. This Catholic religious order, which has a priory a few hours north of our museum, first arrived in Osmot in 1958 and began acquiring objects through purchase, trade, and as gifts. Much of our collection was initially housed at the Crozier Osmot Museum in Hastings, Nebraska, which was established in 1975. 20 years later, the American Museum of Osmot Art was formally created and moved to a new facility in Shoreview, Minnesota. The collection was given to the University of St. Thomas in 2007, and the current museum opened on the second floor of the Anderson Student Center in 2012. The AMAA, located in St. Paul, Minnesota, is approximately 8,300 miles from Osmot. Physical distance, language barriers, and unreliable technology has made it difficult to establish and sustain relationships with individuals in the region. To combat some of these issues, I have spent the past few years working to connect our collection with artists in the region through, ge through geospatial technology. I began this process in early 2019 by having students in my Pacific Arts class use Google Maps to virtually place AMAA objects in their regions and villages of origin. Bismam, Bisembam, Safon, and Unir Saro were chosen as a focus for this experiment because our museum has a relatively large number and wide range of objects from cultural groups residing in these areas, 
which is partially due to the Catholic missionaries that were stationed in the region. Soon after, I was given a digital humanities grant and an undergraduate assistant who helped me create a basic ArcGIS map based on content generated by my Pacific art students and regional information adapted from scholarly text published as recently as 2009. As part of the ESRI Geospatial Cloud, ArcGIS allows for the creation of interactive data-driven maps, which have become an essential platform for many of the COVID-19 dashboards we are now familiar with. Following several months of editing, the final draft of this map was uploaded on an iPad in our gallery to accompany the 2019-2020 exhibition, which featured many of the same objects that were pre-selected by my Pacific Art students. This allowed museum visitors to physically view AMAA carvings and weavings while viewing the virtual map to see specifically where the objects came from. There were a number of limitations with this first ArcGIS map. It was difficult to delineate the cultural regions and only one image and accompanying text could be added for each village. This forced us to create multiple entries for the same location, which made the map overly complicated and less intuitive. Despite these challenges, a later collaboration with students and faculty in the geography department resulted in more detailed virtual and physical maps, which were used in our gallery space, at our community partner school, and at the Voyages Through Osmod Art exhibition at the Minneapolis St. Paul Airport. In November of 2019, I was given the opportunity to accompany an American Crozier father on a trip to Osmot. My main goal while in Osmot was to establish connections with museum officials and missionaries in the region, acquire images and information for my digital maps, and to initiate relationships with local people, particularly the carvers and weavers. Our visit coincided with the 50th anniversary of the celebration for the Diocese of Agat and the 34th annual cultural festival. Witnessing and participating in these events added to my understanding of the contemporary relationship between Osmot people, the Catholic Church, and the Osmot Museum of Culture and Progress. Most of my time in Osmot was spent in the administrative center of Agats. While visiting the old museum, I wondered how my maps could build off Bishop Sawada's legacy by documenting Osmot visual culture for future generations and by providing access to these materials for edu educational purposes in Osmot and beyond. In the new museum, I took 360 degree shots of the exhibition space for my projects and shared them via a web link with staff at the Osmot Museum of Culture and Progress. These images were also loaded into virtual reality headsets at our university. This allowed students at St. Thomas to learn by virtually exploring the museum in Agats and was a way for me to give back to their museum. About halfway through our visit, we traveled further inland to the villages of Sawa, Saa Air, and Irma Sona, where we conducted interviews with carvers and worked with elementary students as part of a cultural exchange program through our university. I also purchased weavings for, for our museum, established connections with English speaking volunteers in the region, and saw the effects of gaharu harvesting. These experiences added to my understanding of current social and environmental issues in Osmot thus influencing what should be included on my maps in the future. I returned to the United States and in early 2020, my undergraduate geography assistant and I created new ArcGIS story maps that featured scrolling formats, making it possible to provide information about Osmot through photos, videos, text, VR technology, and interactive maps. We designed a main map of Osmot that included regional divisions based on the 12 major cultural groups, Hyperlinks to individual story maps were included for most of the villages in Osmot, which could be accessed by clicking on one of the dropped pins. After clicking on the link, users would be taken to a map about a specific village. While scrolling, there were options to further explore objects from the AMAA collection by clicking on links to our museum website or to learn more about other villages within the same cultural region by clicking on additional pins. Imagery incorporating, incorporated during this phase of the project was provided by myself, AMAA board members, Indonesian photojournalists, Dutch filmmakers, and other Osmot collections within the United States. As 2020 progressed, COVID-19 spread in Minnesota and many of us started working from home. This change, while presenting some challenges, made it easier to virtually meet with my geography assistant and have conversations with those in Indonesia and Osmot through Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and Zoom. 
It also helped me consider how digital tools could be used for documentation, relationship building, and to promote art making practices by collaborating with those in Osmot. In May of 2020, the murder of George Floyd in nearby Minneapolis, Minnesota resulted in racial unrest locally and internationally. Support was triggered for oppressed Papuans and the Papuan Lives Matter movement, with Floyd, Floyd's death recalling the killing of two Papuans the month before. These events further emphasized injustices I witnessed while in Osmot and forced me to re-examine what it means to be a steward of visual culture from an underrepresented community. I've spent these first few months of 2021 reflecting on my experiences over the past two years and rethinking the purpose of my maps, which were initially created to showcase our museum collection and situate it geographically. I'm now considering, considering how ArcGIS and digital tools could be used to develop a virtual network combining Osmot collections and archives around the globe with indigenous knowledge. Internet access and smartphone technology has made it possible to share sections of my maps with people in Osmot and have since, which, who have since provided feedback and visual resources for areas that are lacking, including photographs and video footage from villages I have never visited. This type of collaboration will provide a more comprehensive and accurate understanding of Osmot history while promoting contemporary voices. I look forward to the upcoming months and realizing the potential for these projects to preserve visual records of objects, discover absent narratives, and reinvigorate Osmot visual, visual culture through accessible digital tools and worldwide comp contributions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gretchen. That was really interesting to hear about as well. Uh, and I'd like to invite uh, people to ask questions of the presenters, which I'll have a look. So Alba Fernandez gordons um, really interesting digital work, congratulations. I have a question for Alana. We know that sometimes communities struggle with accessing digital content. So my question is, how do you reach the communities in the first place? How do you guarantee communities have access to the archives? Uh, great question, Alba, thank you. Um, so generally we tend to work with sort of the regional associations uh, in the Pacific. So some of the big ones that come to mind right now are Piala, that's the Pacific Island Association of Libraries and Archives. Um, a, a, a number of Pacific Island countries are involved with that one. Um, another one is Paradisec, which is the um, Pacific and Regional Archive and Digital Sources in Endangered Languages, Endangered Cultures, excuse me. Um, and then another one is Parbica, which is the Pacific Regional Branch in the International Council on Archives. So those are kind of the three main ones in the Pacific. And we tend to sort of work through with them to try and figure out which communities might, might need this. Um, additionally, each island actually has their own um, um, regional library association. I realize that's kind of a good way to reach out because, you know, when you work with a lot of Pacific communities, sometimes the, the one place where there is, you know, internet access is in a library. And so that's kind of a you, you get a lot of community members sort of going there to, to access um, archival stuff. And so that, that's generally how we, how we do it. We don't go out into the community and, and um, at least not initially, and unless, unless we're asked. And it seemed that you had um, um, museums in some cases working as intermediaries, I'm thinking yeah. of the Australian situation that you mentioned. Yeah. It, yeah, it tends to be museums, libraries, and universities are sort of the initial contacts, and they usually have specific people that are either members of a particular community or clan, or um, you know, know know of one that might need might need some assistance in, in their digital repository. Yeah, and I might actually um, throw that question to you, Gretchen, because obviously the digital um, availability to people in ASMAT is uh, probably a bit limited. Yeah, so they're right now they're building a new museum and it will have a library and part of what I'm trying to do is um, provide some physical resources for the library, but also these digital tools that can be accessed um, through the help of their assistant curator. So it's the same thing where they um, go to the museum, hopefully to find some of those resources, but there is uh, with smartphone technology, the ability 
to get out to some of the villages within the region. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. Um, we have another question here from Anonymous. Um, thanks for these excellent presentations. This question is for Gretchen. How does your digital work go forward from here? How do you spread the word about this work too? So um, what I've been doing the last few months is just, well, since I've been kind of trapped at home, <laughs> is just um, taking the time to reach out to my contacts in Osmot via those different apps that I mentioned, whether it's Instagram or um, through Facebook and things like that. Otherwise, we have been able to have video chats over WhatsApp recently. So that's been pretty encouraging, which um, I, you know, wasn't an option for us before. So I think with new technology and how it's spreading in the region, you know, it's still somewhat lacking, but there is potential going forward to communicate with the carvers and weavers in the area through that technology. Now I can imagine you personally going to um, the ASMAT, ASMAT area made that possible because you were able to build the connections then? Yeah, I initiate some of the connections and then I've really worked on them over the past year or so, you know, kind of branching out and connecting with new people. But, um, you know, within, <laughs> within our technical capabilities. Yeah. Uh, and we have a question from Oliver Loeb. Uh, thank you for your presentations. For Gretchen, uh, is there any digital infrastructure in the region? So I think you've sort of answered that as well. Uh, is the Indonesian government involved in the project? Uh, not at this point. Right now, we're a few of us that are um, researching or have spent time in the region are trying to find a way to assist with their museum, the construction, and maybe even plug it into the Indonesian museum system. So that's more connected that way. But these are all things that are still in the works. Mm -hmm. I think we may have some, I think that was it for the formal questions. Uh, are there questions that either of you have for the other? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll have to check out the, the Makutu. Yeah, and that's that's great. I I use Story Maps a lot too to to, to showcase some of um, some of their work. It's it's a cool platform. Um, but yeah, that's it's awesome to hear the work that you're doing in that region. And, um, yeah. yeah, seeing the Makutu um, image that you showed for the Northwest Tribes, and mm -hmm. when you turned the page and there was a picture of an audio file which you said was a song, and already I could feel how powerful that is as a tool where instead of it just being a picture of a bakery interior actually the story attached to that makes it so much more a completely different uh thing then yeah yeah being able to kind of have multiple um you know multiple rec or multiple ways to showcase a record you can include you know google maps is embedded you can put in audio files images videos um but yeah, it's, it's, it's neat to see how these various communities have chosen to kind of showcase their archive and, um, yeah, yep. disseminate their, their work. Great. Well, I might wrap up there. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, one uh, sorry there's, I cannot switch on my, on my video, so <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, there's a, a, um, a comment from Oliver who is uh, asking whether Alana could uh, share her contact details. Um, with the group. <laughs> uh, sure, I think I'll that in right now. <laughs> if you, but if you, if you like, I can, if, if you uh, let me, I can share uh, your email address with uh, Oliver, if that's okay with you. Yeah, and I, I can put it in the chat too okay. right now. That's, that's fine. <laughs> um, so another question from Anonymous. Um, potentially a different anonymous. Um, Gretchen, how do you manage ethics clearance when working remotely slash digitally? Yeah, so these projects, they're not publicly published at this point because I have been reaching out to some of the diversity, equity, and inclusion groups on campus, uh, on our campus. And then also, I just want to make sure that I, you know, I am being ethical about the images that I'm presenting within Osmot. Um, you know, there's 
a lot of nudity and you know children and just showing those types of images I'm still questioning how those might be um, kind of plugged into these digital projects so they're not publicly available yet and part of the reason for that is because I have sources from our board or um, photographs that I took but I'm hoping to plug in information uh, from these indigenous sources for a lot of the villages that I you know don't have photographs for at this point so um, that's something I'm still trying to navigate and if anybody has resources I would be happy to <laughs> look at them. Cool thank you. Yeah, I think, I also think that that's it for now for questions. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.